Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Today, I conduct a conversation with an English conductor who started out as a professional trombonist, but after winning the Cadaquez competition in 2010, his career as a conductor took off. He was assistant conductor of the Halle, and from 2015 to 2020, he was the music director of the Orquesta Sinfonica de Castilla y León in Spain. It's a great pleasure to welcome Andrew Gourlay. Andrew, it is really nice to see you today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mike. Lovely to be doing this with you. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, I always go back to the beginning and ask people about their earliest musical experiences. I'm intrigued to find out when it happened. Were you, because according to the ever-reliable Wikipedia, you were born in Jamaica, (laughs) then moved to the Bahamas, then the Philippines, then Japan, and then the UK. So at which point of your cosmopolitan childhood did you first encounter music and grow to love it? Yes, good question. You know, it must have been in the Philippines, but uh, my most formative memories really musically were in Japan. Yeah. Um, although I'm told that I started out on the piano in the Philippines, right. um, supposedly because my sister, who was a few years older than me, was having piano lessons. Mm. I was about six at the time and I kept running in and interrupting her lessons by smashing down the keys of the piano. So the <laughs> only solution was to give me piano lessons of my own. Yeah. But really, uh, Japan is where it all started for me musically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- I'm assuming your parents were doing something of diplomatic core, or uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite a, a wonderful childhood to experience all of these countries so young. Yeah, it really is astonishing. And, you know, even more so now, uh, it's quite strange now being at the same age that my parents were when uh, we were doing a lot of that moving around. And it makes me realise even more quite how exotic uh, their lifestyle was. Mm. Um, I mean, the thought now of uh, going and moving to the Caribbean, it's quite a wonderful (laughs) thought, for example. But um, no, my father was working for an insurance company, then Royal Insurance, and uh, uh, they were free spirited as a couple my mother taught English as a foreign language and they were happy to travel and be posted abroad and so um, having met at Nottingham University they suddenly found themselves being posted to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia (laughs) and uh, that must have been quite an amazing experience but I wasn't born yet Um, they then moved on to Jamaica where I was born and uh, sort of joined the ride really. So it does say, going back to Wikipedia again, and up probably on your website as well, because uh, I do do my homework, dear listener, um, it does say piano and trombone. And, of course, the trombone becomes uh, the big thing in your life for a while. When, when did you start the trombone? You know, it's a really important topic for me, that, because uh, the, the trombone... Um, goodness knows whether I would have taken up a second instrument having started out on the piano, but the school I went to in Tokyo, which was very much an international school, uh, pretty much based on an American system of education, um, although it was extremely international. Uh, When we got to grade five, which I think must have been around age nine or 10, perhaps, um, we we all found ourselves being forced to take part in some kind of group musical activity. Right. And so either you sang in the school choir or as another alternative, you walked around all of the instruments of an American concert band, tried them all out. And if there was one that you connected with, you uh, got a you bought a beginner's model of it um, and started group lessons mm. and the trombone. I my one of my best friends at the time he decided he was going to learn the trombone i thought yeah go on then i will as well i got a, a note out of it which i didn't out of some of the others <laughs> and and i thought yeah this seems like a fun instrument and yeah good goodness knows if i'd be doing what i am today if that uh, hadn't happened i'm sure it wouldn't frankly and you know it does i say it's an important topic for me because the key there was that everyone was suddenly taking part in some kind of group activity. Mm. So there was none of this issue of whether or not classical music was cool enough for certain students. It was a very unique um, system, I think. Mm. Uh, I'm assuming, therefore, when it mentions that you come back to the UK, was that to go to music college or had you come back as a family already by then? It was a family decision, really. I think... uh, 
the decision was made somewhat earlier, probably in the Bahamas. I mean, so the story goes, my father tells me that really they they had the option then to continue moving around as expats with the knowledge that they'd probably settle back in the UK and, you know, thinking of education for my sister and me and, mm. you know, just general um, uh, strength of, of government, society and everything, uh, stability in life they made that decision must have been a pretty grueling one because i think the alternative was pretty much to stay in the bahamas for the rest of their lives <laughs> which uh i mean i probably wouldn't have complained about but i'm sure i'd be no. doing something somewhat more lethargic than uh, <laughs> conducting i, I think so. running a dive, dive shop or something <laughs> like that would be rather wonderful yeah and uh, talking of conducting at what point did it first enter into your life as something that you were interested in? I mean, obviously, if you were playing in a sort of American band system in Japan, somebody would have been conducting it. But maybe it was when you came home and you joined youth orchestras or school orchestras. When did conducting first become something that you thought, actually, that's rather interesting? It was extremely late on that I got into conducting. I mean, actually, I think a lot of my musical training started up later than most. Mm. Uh, once we came back to the UK, I was um, I was barely uh, a teenager. In fact, I think I must have been 11 or 12. Um, so, you know, I hadn't really started to take it so seriously. There was no pressure on me from my parents. It was very much just something for enjoyment at that stage. I think the real trigger, if I'm honest, must be joining my county youth orchestra. Mm. Um, that was Kent County Youth Orchestra, because I suddenly found myself entering a world of repertoire that had never existed. I still remember my first course was uh, with Debussy's La Mer. And as a trombonist, that suddenly opens up such a different world of textures and that has a pretty important steer, I think, in the direction I went. Mm. But even then, it was only really at music college that I started even considering the idea of doing any conducting for myself. Mm. And as so often happened with me, it was through seeing other friends of mine uh, doing something and making me think, well, I could have a go at that as well, couldn't I? Mm. So very much music college that was the trigger. I'm going to linger on something there because I had no idea that you were an ex-member of the Kent County Youth Orchestra, because you're talking to another one. Uh, I was in Don't it from, believe it. Yes, I was in it from 1985 to 1990, uh, and actually near the end, one of the last things I played was La Mer with Alan Vincent conducting. Uh, so I when, had Alan Vincent as well. Yeah. Oh, when, when did you yeah, join? I was there, well, it must have been... It must have been in the second half of the 90s. Yeah. But Alan was still going strong. I think we were we had the last few, probably the last few years of Alan. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Mm, mm. Yeah, Alan. <laughs> so it obviously had a big impact. Yeah, I saw last saw Alan. Uh, I was conducting the LPO in Eastbourne, and and he's got a a sort of weekend place there. And he came along to the concert, and it was so nice to see Alan and Carol. Mm. And, and uh, yeah, he was a man who was very, very, very important in my life. And uh, dear listener, listen back to episode fifty and discover how he saved me from uh, from uh, fate worse than death before going to music college. Um, but yeah, what a what a coincidence! I had no idea about that. That's wonderful. Um, where did you go to music college? And were you, did you have performing in orchestra goggles on or were you just going there to take a, a music degree? What was your plan? Did you have one? It's somewhat of a uh, reflection of how open-minded or unfocused I was within music at that stage that I decided um, I would probably go to university and study music academically. Yeah. And Funnily enough, the only music college that I ended up uh, going to audition for uh, was the RNCM, the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, because they had a joint course in music with Manchester University, mm. which allowed me to ideally have the best of both worlds. And I ended up going down that route. And absolutely right, it certainly did give me the best of both worlds because I kept my academic music going to give me that kind of grounding and a safeguard, I suppose, for the future. But, you know, within the first week, I realised I wanted to be involved in performance. Mm. And I think there was 
there was a real competitive drive that was suddenly unleashed in me by having all of these other trombonists around. I mean, by that stage, I decided I'd focus on the trombone because I loved the orchestral world so much. And I didn't think I was at a sufficient standard to become a piano soloist. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I wasn't. Um, But having all of these other players around who were better than me, I hadn't really experienced that so much at a school and county level. And it was really important for me. And I think, you know, some people crumble under that. I totally thrived and made me work hard and made me want, made me want to be a better player. So, yeah, important place. So at the end of the RNCM, your um, your time at uh, the Royal Northern College, out into the big wide world and gigging, you're gigging as a trombonist. Um, who were you working with? Who did you get gigs with? And what was that like? Um, I mean, I know what it's like, but tell everybody what it's <laughs> I don't know what it's like to sit in a trombone section. I think that may well be a different beast than the second violins, but tell, tell, tell us what it's like. Well, yeah, the trombone section has its own identity, I think, purely because you're so far away from the conductor. And so you you have your own little world that you form. And it's very, um, very noticeable to me how objective the view of a conductor is from the back corner. Mm. You know, you have all of that space to analyse and all of the time in the music when you're not playing as well to analyse. But my first concerts uh, with pro orchestras as a trombonist in Manchester at the end of my college years were with uh, Opera North, uh, with the Halle Orchestra, um, the BBC Phil as well. And, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant quality of music making. I think um, my first... Uh, my first two gigs were uh, Don Giovanni with uh, Opera North, where, of course, you know, the challenge is um, being taken to the pub whilst the opera has already started <laughs> and learning to deal with all of that. I think those days are on their way out, but yes. um, then just w- wandering quietly into the pit and having to deliver on your first professional gig. Very hard, but, um, you know, good training for <laughs> some of the profession. Yes. Um, and... Uh, I mean, I really did enjoy the the quality of that uh, orchestra as well. It was such a step up for me. Um, another one was the Halle Orchestra in the MEN Arena, which is one of these gigantic spaces in Manchester. Uh, and that was a, a kind of pops classical concert. And I found myself playing um, second trombone on a bolero and uh, playing one of the solos in it. And, uh, you know, as a gesture from my teacher, um, Andy Berryman, I mean, brilliant, brilliant training. Um, And it wasn't uh, then until I found myself in London um, doing my uh, first gigs with the Philharmonia, especially, that I was becoming more conflicted with Mm. um, my my journey into conducting. And a lot of those questions became harder and harder as it went on and as my priorities shifted. So you, when you left the RNCM, you then went and did, I can't remember what the course name is at the at the Royal College of Music, the RCM. Um, so you were gigging as a trombonist and also studying conducting, um, the, which means that when you're playing as a trombone, I would imagine you were doing what I was doing, which is you weren't being a backseat passenger and sitting there playing Candy Crush on your phone and reading the news newspaper. You were watching it, the conductor's every move. Who do you remember playing for thinking, now this is, this is different gravy or, you know, were there also occasions when you sat there and thought, right, I must make a mental note never to ever say that particular line when I stand in front of a orchestra. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a sad fact, isn't it? That a lot of us who go into conducting from players, um, a large part of that journey is through a critical eye of watching people make mistakes and doing yes. things that you promise that you'll never do. And you probably find yourself doing those exact same things a couple of decades later. Yeah. But, um, you know, I suppose I was so lucky that apart from all of the great conductors that you have in front of you with the professional orchestras, um, you know, countless names, but one particular relationship um, when I was at the Royal College of Music, 
on my conducting course who I experienced as a player in the college orchestra as well was Bernard Heitink. Mm. And so I found myself arriving at Royal College of Music to do a conducting course and yet being enrolled straight into the orchestra to play principal trombone on a Bruckner nine with Heitink. Mm. Um, I mean, there, there can't really be better training than that because by that stage I was so psychologically involved in what a conductor was doing. So mm. to be so close to him, and then actually have the opportunity later to have some lessons as well. Um, I can't think of a better instructional uh, week than than playing under Heitink's baton in a Bruckner symphony. No, I can't either. It's, it's one of my great regrets that I never played for him. Uh, and rest in peace, Bernard, because he died not so long ago uh, from when we were recording this, this episode. Um, how long was your course at the RCM? Who was teaching you other than Bernard Heitink? Um, and... Was it very much a whole overall holistic approach or was it very much score reading or technique? I just adored my training at uh, the RCM. I was there on somewhat of an overlap. I was there for two years mm. um, and my first year was the last year of Neil Thompson, who had been teaching there for a fair while. Mm. Um, and he, I could not have asked for a better teacher. He, his approach was um, less uh, founded in the, um, the, the score reading and uh, musical structural training, which I think was somewhat taken as a given and was factored into the audition process, mm. but much more in, in what I thrive off, which is just the, the musical preparation and the thought process behind instrumentalists. And, mm. and he actually taught in silence, which... Personally, um, any teaching I do myself now, I do the same. If you imagine yourself in a room without a pianist mm. and presumably with other practice rooms next to you with different sounds and different rep coming out of them, and you find yourself just in front of Neil uh, at a music stand and your score and having to totally inhabit the music in your mind... And, you know, as a shock to the system, when you're first starting out learning conducting, it really teaches you that you, quite frankly, don't yet know the music well enough. Yes, yeah. Um, because to be able to focus that clearly on the music and, and really uh, keep in the frame of mind, steer the music through in silence, you, you just have to feel it inside your body. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very good training. It's something I've heard another conductor do on one of the earlier, or conducting teacher do on one of the earlier episodes. And it's something I think I'm going to adopt more and more as I teach this thing that, you know, it's got, you've got to have it, the score in your head, and also be able to hear that score in your head and then be able to, you know, the two piano thing is becoming more and more, and more frustrating when I've been there and done that, cl those classes, um, mm. because it's just not the same experience so yeah I've it's not the same experience and i think yeah. so often you know it just goes to show when you're uh, uh, working up an opera with a rep there are some extraordinarily talented repetiteurs out there yeah. um but you know no matter how much they uh have the skill of slightly delaying the sound in an orchestral way you'll never get the same contact with the sounds that no. you get when you're conducting an orchestra but what was so good i think for me i say you know neil taught me for my first year he gave me that real rigorous training and confidence but then in my second year when uh, neil had uh, had left the college um, I had all sorts of different influences coming in. So I had um, some training from Janos Furst, from Peter Stark, uh, Mike Rosewell in the opera department, Alexander Polyonichko, Bernard Heitink, as I say, mm. came in to do some masterclasses. Marin Olsup came to do a masterclass. I mean, what better way really to, than to have that rigour and then open up and have all these different influences and pick and choose depending on what works for your mindset and your body. I've, it, with hindsight, it was the perfect training. It sounds like it. Um, very, very, very good list of names and different approaches and different styles. And it's what you want. Um, uh, you want to be able to, you know, take from some and, and whatever. Um, now, you rehearsed a programme for Bernard Heitink and for Roger Norrington, and I've rehearsed a programme for you um, uh, well, I, when you conducted the CBS Youth Orchestra. So I know what this entails, but how did you find rehearsing a programme for somebody, knowing that you weren't doing the concert? Because I think that's a, 
quite a specific skill. I, I really enjoy doing it because it means that I learned the repertoire very well. But how did you find it? And did you, because I remember when I, I did the Rite of Spring for you, I, I asked you specific questions about beating, obviously, with the Rite of Spring. But with the other pieces, I don't think I even mentioned we ever talked about them. I just rehearsed them and put it in a neutral state, ready and prepared, so that you could put your musical stamp on it. Did you have Bernard telling you what he wanted or Sir Roger Norrington telling you what he wanted? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. Mm. Um, and I totally empathise with what you were saying, Mike, because, you know, the Rite of Spring is probably one of the very few pieces that it really is wise to double check yes. the beating patterns. You know, yeah. if you if you get uh, a couple of these dancers into the orchestra's system with the strong beats on the, on the note as opposed to on the rest, mm. um, as one little example then it can totally muck up the rest of the project, I think. Yes. Uh, whereas with the vast majority of repertoire, as long as you um, take a center, a central approach, you know, down the average of what most people would do, then I think you're on pretty safe ground for the, the next conductor to come along and shape it as they wish. Um, so I think you're right. It's, it's a question of neutral ground, isn't it? You just want to familiarise the orchestra as well as you can with the music um, and make sure everyone knows what could happen. I mean, at the end of the day, don't you think, if there are places which could go a couple of ways, there's no harm in doing it a couple of times both ways, and then they're prepared for whatever comes. Exactly um, true. I've done it with the CBSA Youth Orchestra where I've handed it over to people like yourself, to Jack Van Steen, Martin Brabins. I've said, you know, I... There are no recordings. I don't know how he does it. So uh, it could go this, it could go that, but I'm just going to rehearse mainly down the centre. But just once or twice, let's do a super fast or a super slow or a once in two rather than in four. Um, I also do, do, do remember um, doing exactly the same job for the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra because uh, they were going to do Shostakovich 4 with Valery Gergiev. And I went and did a day and a half rehearsal for him, ahead of him turning up on the day and conducting Shostakovich 4. At least with that, there were two recordings of it, and I could say, well, in both recordings, this tempo seems to be about the one he likes, but then there are there are differences here, there, and you know, in a few other places. But yeah, I think that it's, middle road. Yeah, go on. It's, it's funny you mention that because actually, I suppose my most intense preparation experience, um, similarly, was for Valery Gergiev with the Rotterdam Orchestra. Right, and I mean, I couldn't have asked for a more wonderful set of rep. But you know, that's an intense experience because. I was preparing two concerts worth. There was uh, Alzo Sprach Zaratustra. There were two different Isle of the Deads. There was the Rachmaninoff, right. which is meat and two veg for me. And also a Rager Isle of the Dead. There was a Schedrin Piano Concerto. <laughs> you know, this was really a uh, duty, a cello concerto. It's a lot of rep to do in a few days. And mm. um, I mean, I don't know how Valeri does it going from orchestra to orchestra and then on such little rehearsal time, um, just uh, snaffling off these pieces. It's quite incredible. Mm, and turning them into his own from what you've handed them over, handed over to them, you know, in the first place. Your, Gergiev's name does crop up in a list of people that you've been a cover conductor for. And again, it's not a subject we've really talked about that much on the po podcast. You cover conducted for Mazur, Ger for cover conducted for Mazur, Gergiev, uh, Esapeka Salonen, and Sir Colin Davis. That basically means you're going to be there for all of the rehearsals and not really ever conduct very much. <laughs> Gergiev accepted, um, uh, but and and you know you're basically there in case something goes drastically wrong. They trip up over a curb and break their arm on the way into the concert. Is that am I right there, or or is there anything else involved with that? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, yes, with Gergiev, you're right that the 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 strike rate is probably a little higher as a cover <laughs> yeah. conductor. Yeah. And you know, as an example, then uh, you know, I wasn't meant to do the general rehearsal. I found myself. Um, starting off the general rehearsal and then uh, um, once uh, Valerie's plane landed and he'd walk into the rehearsal midway through an Isle of the Dead and uh, it's literally handing over the baton mid, yeah. mid work which is great fun um, and to feel that connection with you know one of your heroes is really special um, mm. for all of these conductors you mentioned I mean it's 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 really I, I take um, 
uh, Esa Pekka as, a, as an example. So the covering then was he was doing some very fast paced back and forths between Paris and London at the time of the terrorist incidents there. Uh-huh. And of course, uh-huh. you know, travel was a real concern. And so if you've got some uh, complex rep and, you know, big name soloists, Lang Lang was involved, um, you there's only so much of a risk you can take knowing that it's cutting it a bit fine. Mm. And so then you're in a very different, um, a very different kind of ethos, aren't you? Because you're not going for a central route of uh, musical averages. You're trying to inhabit the conductor that you're working with. You're mm. watching those rehearsals and you're trying to, um, you know, I think it's perhaps a little, um, it's people don't really talk about this often enough because you're having to become someone else's body a lot of the time don't you think mike that a lot of the decisions we make are based on our structure and what feels right in the arm whether or not you're subdividing whether or not you're beating big beats or small beats and so to find yourself having to cover for a conductor who's structurally totally different to you, it's actually quite good training, I find. You mm. have to push yourself to conduct in a way which you wouldn't normally do. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the, the one time I stood in for somebody who'd already started the process was when I stood in for Andrews Nelson's at the end of a long CBSO tour. And, you know, my job there was not to suddenly come in and start rocking the boat and saying, right, well, actually, I do Sibelius too this way. You know, the orchestra was playing it really bloody brilliantly under Andrew. So I'd be stupid to try and rock the boat. Uh, and, you know, yeah, you, I quickly realised that, you know, if I conducted in the same sort of manner, then I'd get the same sort of results. I mean, over the course of three concerts, of course, things I did more started to happen. But, um, yeah, I remember that first concert, you know, two hours before the concert, I was, I was playing in the orchestra and then... 90 minutes before the concert, I was conducting it. Uh, and you know, all of a sudden I'm looking at his scores, I'm looking at his markings and it's and, and thinking, well, what did he do there last night? Because I've completely forgotten because you know I've been to sleep, been on a coach, been on a plane, been on a coach, gone to a hotel and forgotten. Um, and yeah, it's it's tricky. It, it, really, it really is a difficult thing to do. That's actually a very stressful thing. I, I don't think my memory fades these days, but I don't think I've had to... Uh, step into a concert that I really wasn't expecting to conduct at that last moment before the concert. I've had quite a few cancellations where I've um, arrived pretty late in the day or had the entire rehearsal run. I mean, actually, my dream cancellations are being asked to um, to go up with no notice, but just in time for the first rehearsal, because then Mm. you can still do what you want with the music, inhabit it. I think probably the most stressful, it strikes me, is to have to go up just in time for the general rehearsal because, <laughs> you, you know, what can you do in that general rehearsal? It's almost better to, uh, to just suddenly be dropped into the concert, I think. Yeah. And then you've got everyone on tenterhooks watching you like the clappers trying to yeah. make sure they follow. I had half an hour before that concert in Dortmund, um, which I used stressful. To... Yeah, it was. It was pretty stressful. Uh, talking of stressful and something I wouldn't know about because I've I was I was too old to enter to any of these because as you'll know the highest cutoff age for most conducting competitions is 35 and I started conducting when I was 35 so I was thankfully too old to enter one but you did and in 2010 you won the Cadiz Orchestra International Conducting Competition now I happen to know that's quite a lot of repertoire and quite a difficult one to win can you remember what you had to conduct um and, and at the end of it, I, I have questions about aftercare, but uh, do you remember the, the competition well, or is it re- um, sort of faded into the memories? Oh, you know, I, I'm not going to be drawn into the rep because that is a total haze for me. Yeah. But I, I do totally remember that uh, it was a monumental around, amount of uh, repertoire to learn. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that was part of the, the test of it. One of the real features was the learning of a contemporary piece during the competition. Mm. 
Wow. And actually that really suited me because I'd done a fair bit of contemporary music and I'm, I'm pretty fast uh, with contemporary effects that some other people might not have come across, perhaps from my brass playing days. Mm. But it means that, you know, you turn up to this competition with your pile of, I mean, it's like being back at school again, you know, with the full rucksack, with yeah. all the textbooks in, you got your full bag of scores. And then you arrive at your first day, uh, ready to do the first round on Soldier's Tale. Um, and you're presented with a, a brand new contemporary score that no one's seen before. And so somehow amidst all of the cramming for the next day's um, round of competition, you're learning this piece. Um, I, remember, I remember two things in particular about that competition. I remember firstly, that I was so close to pulling out of it before I left the UK for Cadaqués yeah. because I didn't feel that I had done quite enough preparation. I, I'd been pushed for time with um, all sorts of work I was doing in uh, the UK at the time. Um, and, you know, thank God I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it goes without saying. But yeah. I think part of the reason I did well in that competition was because I was mentally free from it and I wasn't really expecting myself to do well. Mm. Um, and it also made that learning process and the late night cramming and everything so intense. Um, I also had the confidence to put my own stamp on things. Um, the, the other thing which really sticks out for me is how a friend of mine, Matt Wood, uh, who was also involved in the competition, um, how he got behind me once he had got knocked out. Right. Um, and I'll never forget that gesture because there's so much potluck with these competitions. Um, you, you, the, you know, when, when you've got that number of people, I think of all the applicants, 75 got invited to be there in the competition, which is a pretty high number of yeah. conductors swanning around a tiny little <laughs> coastal village. <laughs> It's crazy in number of conductors, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. Really is. And uh, so, you know, anything can happen. Yeah. And for, for someone who was in competition with me to get behind me, and I, I specifically remember him saying, right, come on, Andrew, we're going to get you to do this. You're going to win it. And to, to support me like that was just such a touching gesture. Mm. And it really set me up, I think, for, for the final. Um, after winning, uh, I mean, you may well have already had an agent by now. Um, was there any aftercare? Um, because in, in previous episodes, we've talked about Besançon competition. You're assigned somebody who looks after you for a year, um, a, a sort of an agent or somebody who's been in the sort of agency world who will, who will, who is there on the end of a phone for you to speak to when agents, when the sharks start circling and, and, you know, when, and when you're trying to also work out how am I going to fit in these engagements that I'm going to be offered as part of winning? Did you have any aftercare or had you already got an agent by then? Well, it, the, the competition was certainly the, um, the impetus for me to get an agent. Um, in 2009, I stopped playing the trombone. That's, mm. um, that's perhaps worth some conversation actually because it was uh agony for me trying to make that call of when to stop playing completely <laughs> tell me about um, it <laughs> but uh, yeah absolutely but um but then not so long after about five months or so after that i auditioned for the halley assistant conductor job and got it mm. and at that point i had discussions with uh, jeff owen who himself was an agent and was the planning manager at the um artistic director at uh, at the uh, halley orchestra and he told me that the time um wasn't necessarily yet upon me and that i should feel relaxed I shouldn't feel pressured to needing an agent yet. Although, as you say, there's interest following an appointment like that. Yeah. But then it was only uh, two or three months later that I suddenly won the Caracas competition. And it was it just a case of need, really. I mean, mm. there was obviously more interest following that. But having to then juggle my prize winning concerts from Caracas with an assistant conductor schedule at the Halle Orchestra really needed an agent. Yeah. And uh, I mean, thankfully, um, everything worked out tremendously because um, Sir Mark Elder, um, who was, uh, you know, my boss, uh, his agent, Jonathan Groves, was. Um, a natural route for me to mm. um, to go down, and uh, thank God Jonathan was 
interested came and saw me uh, rehearsing and it all it all kind of fell into place from there really perfect timing that you'd you know you'd started at the Halle before the competition and and you see you, you already had that in I suppose with Sir Mark Elder and uh, I know he's you know he's been with Groves for forever probably yeah um, and, and yeah that's a that's a, a really that's a big uh, name to be able to chat to and say what you know what's the best the next move what's the best thing to do now absolutely and you know I, I'd never really thought about this before um, until you mentioned it just then but the thought of what would have happened if it had happened the other way around if mm. I'd won the Cadaqués competition and found myself um, with agents approaching <laughs> and without that support network I think that would have been terribly difficult mm. so to have already that support network in place of the um staff at the Halle orchestra who were just tremendous for me and like i say someone with experience in the agency world like jeff and then the support of mark elder and jonathan it was just yeah perfect perfect timing for me mm. andrew we both had a decision to make at some point in our careers as players who wanted to conduct or was there a catalyst or was there a decision? Was, was there a day even or a minute when you thought, right, I've got to do it now? How did you make that decision? And how difficult was it for you to, to put the trombone away forever? In some ways, it was very natural and very straightforward in that uh, I, I always knew what my end goal was in terms of moving to conducting from playing. Oh. Um, and I was able to... Uh, gradually phase out the trombone whilst phasing in the conducting, uh, take a bit more time off playing and then resurrect it fairly quickly. Mm. But it did become more and more grueling when the end was in sight, just knowing that it would be a pretty big call to actually put the instrument in its case and away in a cupboard. Mm. Um, and around the time that I was making that decision, my trombone career was, was moving on up. I mean, I was playing in the Marley Youth Orchestra around then, and I was on trial with the BBC Philharmonic for mm. a couple of years, really. And through those couple of years, my conducting was moving forwards quite rapidly. Um, I was also, you know, doing guest uh, trombone concerts with the Philharmonia. And actually, I think really the, the crux was when I went in to play principal trombone with the BBC Phil, uh, in a concert which included the prelude and Liebestod from uh, Tristan with Jan Andre Noseda conducting. And I remember him doing wonderful things in the studio, getting the dynamic down to absolutely nothing, just in the transition where the trombones have to creep in with their yes. chord. And at that moment, I just thought to myself, I haven't done enough practice for this in the last couple of months. You know, I'd been doing more conducting mm. and that muscle memory and the psychological memory of knowing that you've done quiet note practice many hours a day for the last few months just wasn't there because I was having to neglect it. Yeah. And I thought at that moment, I'm going to get through this and this is going to be my last concert. Mm. And it was a really clear moment for me and I was OK with it. But funnily enough, it was a little while later when the phone rang from the Philharmonia Orchestra to offer me a few different dates, that it really tested me because I'd yes. given up. But I had to, for the first time, say, sorry, but I can't. Yeah. And then they'd offer me a few other date options and I'd have to say no to those as well. In the end, I just said, you know, I have to say I've stopped playing the trombone. Yeah. And that was, that was a really tough call. Yeah. A really tough call. I think the only other thing I'd add is that... Um, I went on a little bit of a pilgrimage in Berlin Phil rehearsals with Simon Rattle. Mm. And I decided that Simon would be a very good person for me to ask about whether or not I should maintain my trombone playing. Yeah. Or not, you know, at what stage I should phase it out. Yeah. And he gave the answer which told me what I wanted to do, which was, he said, well, it sounds like you're, trombone play is going great you know you're very inexperienced still professionally as a conductor which I was I hadn't worked yeah. with the professional orchestra yet he said it sounds like you should uh, you know keep on with the trombone for a while and uh, you know balance them out and see how things move and I realized that I didn't want him to say that and <laughs> that he'd, he'd given the answer I 
was hoping he wouldn't say. Yeah. And I immediately decided that uh, that was it. I needed to give up. Yeah. Because my mind had told me, it's, it's like when you can't decide between two things and you Absolutely. say, oh yeah, wh- whatever you prefer, mate. And then they go and tell you what they want and you realise that isn't what they want, what you wanted them <laughs> what to say. What you wanted at all, no, exactly. Very, very important conversation. He was so encouraging about it. Um, but I realised that I'd already made that decision in my mind. I'd already crossed the precipice. Uh-huh. Um, so funny how things work out, isn't it? It is. It is. Wonderful story. So two years after you finished at the Halle, uh, you become principal guest of Orchestra Sinfonica di Castilla e León. Uh, and the v- very next year, you become music director. That sounds like a love at first sight sort of thing. Um, how many times did you visit them before you became principal guest? And then obviously your principal guest year went rather well, I would imagine. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, this just goes to show how much luck is involved in the industry. Um, and I really do mean that. I'm not, I'm not just saying it. There are so many of us around, aren't there? Mm. And you just need a break occasionally. I, I'm still the same conductor I was when I was going around the London amateur orchestras, building up my repertoire mm. and, you know, constantly questioning myself. And, um, you know, I had ambition, but, uh, you know, we're all mortals here yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and you need a break. So, one of the great joys of winning the Cadaqués competition was that instead of just, you know, giving you some cash and setting you on your way, a bit of PR, uh, they had this uh, network of, of orchestras who were prepared to give prize concerts. Mm. And so one of my concerts um, of quite a few orchestras in Spain um, and other places was with the orchestra in Castilla y León. Um, and yeah, it, it clicked it really clicked. I still remember my first concert um, was the Richard Rodney Bennett Partita, mm-hmm. the uh, Rachmaninoff Paganini Variations, and Vaughan Williams Five. Mm. It's a really fresh uh, program. Yeah, and the orchestra just responded to me so well. Um, they had a wonderful setup there. I went back a few times. Um, after that before the principal guest appointment was made and like you say it just kind of developed very naturally into a, a good working relationship mm. isn't it lovely i mean yeah there are, there are a number of orchestras i conduct regularly that i feel you know this is just such a lovely relationship that you know we trust each other respect each other um nobody seems to want to fight you at all uh, and you just get on with making music and that's that's where you want to be isn't it you know you don't want to go into those places where people want to scrap you uh, or you know that the, the, there's an attitude about the place yeah you want to be going to places regularly i'm going to one very soon now where i've been three or four times and i have a lovely relationship with the orchestra and i can't wait you know it means you can try and do anything really with them Gosh, and that's such a different experience, isn't it? Yeah. Turning up to yeah. an orchestra that you know intimately. And it's not just the orchestra, it's the city, yeah. the hotels, everything is yeah. just feels that much more comfortable. And it allows you to focus on the music instead uh-huh. of the, um, not so much stress, but the anticipation and anxiety of, of knowing quite what it's going to be like as a new <laughs> orchestra. So that familiarity really is wonderful. And, you know, I think in Castilla y León, one of the things which serves the orchestra so well is that they're in this gigantic territory. Um, mm. I mean, Castilla y León is a region. Uh, you know, in, in in the UK, we'd refer to it as a regional orchestra, but this region is bigger than Austria. Wow. And this is the professional orchestra for that entire region. They have a tremendous, gigantic concert hall, which is, you know, really superb to perform in. And there are all these gorgeous little um, hilltop towns around the region, all with their great wines and uh, local foods. And I find that the orchestra is very settled. The, the players, they, they know how to live life and music doesn't always take number one in their lives. It's mm. very much a, a solid foundation and a part of themselves. So you don't quite get the same intensity uh, that you go to in some other places where you know that their entire world revolves around touring and and the, the constant activity of orchestral music. Mm. Oh, that's so true. Um, yeah, orchestras where you, you know, people 
feel that they've got time to have a life outside of the orchestra. They've got time to bring up their kids, to go and get their kids, to take their kids to school, uh, to not feel pressurised. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you do go to some of these orchestras where they're literally at it at least two sessions a day for six or seven days a week, sometimes three sessions and gigging, you feel that it, it, you know, it's just so pressurised and it rubs off on you in the rehearsal process sometimes, I would say. Yes, it certainly does. I mean, the, the thing is, I think it's sometimes neglected about conductors that we, we turn up in front, especially with large rep, that we end up on the podium in front of an orchestra of 100 and we lay down the law. But even in a situation like that where you've got so many players in front of you and it's not, um, it's not as much of a conversation as it would be with a, a group of 10 players. Yeah. Um, you're still taking so much from the players themselves because they're mm. introducing all of their musical ideas in the way that they play and that's affecting you and you're giving them space to give those interpretations. So it is sometimes underestimated, I think, isn't it? How much the players bring to, of themselves to the table. Absolutely. So if they've got relaxed lives, well, then they play in a much more relaxed sort of way, I find or have found. Yes. Um, yeah, which you know, I, I sort of crave, but <laughs> maybe some don't. Maybe some like the, you know, the 200 miles an hour lifestyle. <laughs> I've got to that age. I don't want to go at 200 miles an hour anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that, that's something I think the pandemic is making everyone um, think more about is, yes. uh, you know, now that things are getting back into uh, action, I think people are comparing the lives they had before the pandemic, during the pandemic and now. And I think we'll find ourselves in quite an interesting place in a few years time. One final question for you before we traverse the 10 questions. And it's one that every conductor has been subjected to because every conductor has to go through this. When you get a new score... Do you sit at the piano and look at it that way? Or do you do it with your inner ear? Do you start big and go in small, sort of macro to micro? Or do you start at page one and work your way to the end? And most importantly for the geeks who listen, and I'm one of those geeks, are you a scribbler in of things? Do you use red, blue, black, highlighters, colours, crayons? Or are you a, I don't write anything in, I keep my scores nice and clean, Mike, thank you. What's your, what's your plan? <laughs> Oh, gosh, it's such a hot topic, isn't it? Dangerous topic, I mean, because uh, I think as students, we always used to criticise desperately our um, fellow conductors for the way that they marked up their scores. You know, every time you say, oh, how do you do that bit over there? And then you peer over their pages and think, crikey, I'm glad. Uh, well, they're not going to make it with markings like that. And frankly, <laughs> it's just whatever works for you, isn't it? Absolutely. And, um, you just develop your own system. So um, I am absolutely a scribbler and mm. I always have been. Um, I mean, even when I was a player, I used to mark up my parts so religiously and I'd have everything there. I, it would be clean and well marked. Um, I don't really see the point in not doing so mm. because I'd never forgive myself. Uh, I, mean, I never used to forgive myself as a player if I'd been told to do something and then I didn't mark it in yeah. and then yeah. I didn't do it. But as a conductor as well, I think... I think perhaps what is misunderstood is that for me, by marking scores heavily, it doesn't draw me more into the page. It actually releases me from the page. Because if I know that it's all there for me, mm. then I can get my head up and just uh, be with the orchestra, yeah, knowing that it's all there. And that really then... Um, I mean, yes, <laughs> to skirt over it, I do use some colours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have Where to tell us which colours, but yeah. but we. <laughs> I, what's interesting about it is that those who say, oh, I write nothing in at all, because if I did, I'd be looking at what I'd write, what I was writing. Have uh, that, You know, it's the classic spin. You can spin anything in any direction. My argument is much the same as yours. I see my markings and they pop off the page, which means I actually have to look at the score far less and I can get my head up out of it. Uh, yes. Uh, but the most important thing is, as you've said, you do whatever you're most comfortable with. And that's the point. And would you agree with me that there's an element of visual um, 
I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say I have photographic memory because I don't, but there is an element of uh, photography about it. Don't you yeah. think that if you're marking in your own markings, you're starting to take ownership of that. And then when you have your head up with the orchestra, you're feeling those markings of yours go past and you're somewhat in more inhabited in the score. Mm. I mean, there's got to be a reason, hasn't there, why teachers tell you when you're revising uh, to make notes mm. because if you just stare at a page of of academia it's much harder to get it in than to yeah. actually uh notate mark things up mark little notes and it's surely it's got to be the same with music but that's just the way that i work perhaps you work and uh, some others do and others others would disagree at this point andrew and i carried on talking about preparing scores and how much a conductor should plan ahead as to how they want the music to be played whilst trying to keep an open mind to ideas from the players. If you want to hear that 10-minute discussion, I've turned it into a Patreon-exclusive bonus mini-episode. For as little as £5 a month, you can get access to this mini-episode, as well as all of the other previous mini-episodes. You'll also get a monthly bulletin podcast from me about my career, as well as advanced news about this podcast. You also get an interview once a month with a prominent person from the classical music world who has dealings with conductors as well as articles, essays, and all sorts of other conducting-based content. The details of how to join are in the show notes below, and I'd love to see you subscribe to the Supporters Club of A Mic on the Podium very soon. Now, it's time for the 10 questions with my guest, Andrew Gurley. Andrew, it is that time when every conductor gets to answer the, the 10 questions, and you will be no different and as ever, I start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? Well, <laughs> um, in terms of sounds I love, I, I suppose there's an evocative sound which uh, has, it's always struck me very occasionally in my life. But, um, you know, that moment if you land somewhere in the tropics, uh, on a plane that is, mm. literally land, and the cabin door opens and you step off the steps. And apart from the, the hit of the heat, it's that noise of the, especially at nighttime, if you land at nighttime and you get the noise of the cicadas and the tree frog, frogs all mixed together. I'm not sure whether it's a childhood thing, whether it takes me back to the Philippines mm. um, and Japan, actually. I mean, Japan has notoriously loud cicadas, but it's, it's that tropical heat at night in combination with that sound of the chirping and the tree frogs, which just, uh, I don't know, I somehow feel like I've come home, which is a ridiculous <laughs> thing to say, speaking to you from London. Yeah. <laughs> but it still has a really strong connection with me. I love it. And a sound that is not quite as lovely as that? Oh, well, yeah, that's a very easy one for me because it's a gripe of mine. I can't stand the noise of loud motorbikes mm. and souped up cars. I think it's uh, all of this talk of pollution at the moment and, uh, you know, plastic pollution, air pollution. Noise pollution is really um, underrated as something which influences and affects the health. Yeah. And I can't stand walking around an otherwise lovely city and then occasionally just being thrashed by the sound of a motorbike going past. Yeah. Yeah. It's infuriating. I can't wait until we're all electric. <laughs> well, it's it's happening more and more down to, you know, Uber Eats and uh, Deliveroo. And yes, <laughs> while some of them are on cycles, a lot of them are on mopeds and motorbikes. And uh, yeah. Um, you uh, know, I also noticed it particularly though recently. My partner is Norwegian. And uh, coming back from Norway recently, when where you know the the large majority of uh, vehicles are electric, yes. you really notice it stepping back into a non-electric society. Just how abrasive and loud it is. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to the uh, progress on that front. If you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? Well, I suppose it does depend if I'm at home or away because you know if if i'm at home especially during a busy patch of um, conducting then i'm really just trying to make the most of being at home so mm -hmm. you know you'd think of me as being pretty slobbish lazing around cooking mm -hmm. yeah. um i've got more into running in the last couple of years so you know running i'm very lucky to live 
um, by the river in Greenwich. So running along the riverside here is just absolutely glorious. Um, and, you know, binge watching, catching up on Netflix series with my partner. Mm. That's a real joy. Um, if I'm away, it's completely the opposite, really, that if I'm in a city that I don't know, I love to make sure I get to know the city. So not necessarily doing all the touristy things, but walking around, exploring the city, getting to know it a bit more like uh, the locals do. Mm. Um, but uh, I suppose also if I've got the time off, if I've got 24 hours um, particularly between concerts in another place, going to a good restaurant, having when I've got the time to not feel rushed, because so often mm. when we're working, we don't have the time to enjoy our food. We're just snaffling things, aren't we? So yeah. to go to a good restaurant, have a good few hours lingering over it, local food, love it. Um, if I've got a bit more time, I'm a bit of an adventurous type for trying to get out into the wilderness if I'm in an exotic place. So, um, you know, I've been skiing, for example, whilst working in Santiago in Chile, gone up into the Andes, uh, same in Auckland. I went off to Wanaka near Queenstown to do some skiing. Um, in San Diego, I rented a Mustang, Wow. Um, rode off along the coast you know it's good fun you see yeah. the area hiking as well as a big one I mean I've been so lucky to go to places like um, Tasmania where you can drive off to Cradle Mountain and just spend a few days uh, in a hut and going hiking by yourself yeah. it's, uh, something special I think about the job name your favorite conductor or conductors of yesteryear well it's sad I suppose that um, he really is yesteryear now but yes. uh, there there is just the one for me um sort of miles up there in the forefront of my mind which is Claudio Abado mm. um and I mean I'd already become really uh, fanatical about his conducting um as a student but then to get the opportunity to play in the Mali Youth Orchestra um I mean on his last tour for example which was just an astronomical standard because all of these players who'd been real uh, fans of Claudio came back to play in that tour. Mm. And we had, uh, we played Schoenberg's Pelias and Melisande and uh, Marla Four, which I wasn't involved with as a trombonist. So I just sat there with my score and watched him. Mm. And it was just his style and sheer class as a conductor i know he went through certain periods in his life and you know in and out of popularity with different orchestras but for me you know all i know of those last years when i was watching him in that rep where he was in his element mm. um i also went to lucerne having left the Mali youth orchestra um i went to lucerne just to watch him rehearsing marla nine and to have the chance to go up to him uh i hadn't had the courage in the marley youth orchestra because i was so i'd, I'd only started out conducting and I, I didn't really have the confidence to tell him that um i was i was doing it i went to lucerne to tell him really that he just meant so much to me in those formative years mm. um and to learn as much as i could in a symphony like that his right hand just the beauty of his right hand conducted. If I could ever uh, match that at any time in my life, I'd be made. Yep. Um, wonderful choice. A fairly popular choice amongst the previous um, people I've interviewed on here. Uh, he's not up here for a while, but uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful conductor. What about uh, your favourite current conductors? This question has been described as cruel, difficult, almost impossible and some one or at least well one or two people have refused to answer it <laughs> well, I, no i certainly wouldn't refuse yeah. um and uh, i suppose the difficulty is uh, like anything where you're talking about your contemporaries um that you know these things chop and change so much don't yes. they because depending on different types of rep it's harder to get a broad brush view of a conductor who's a yeah. contemporary of yours than it is to look back on the entire career of of someone who you admired but I, the the one name which really um, comes to the fore is that shortly after his appointment in berlin um i hadn't seen kirill petrenko conduct and mm -hmm. was quite curious to go and watch him and, you know, when you've got anyone who's had that level of hype, uh, there's always this 
element of um, anxiety, I think, because you fear that you're going to go along and think that uh, the hype doesn't really live up to reality. But I went along and saw a prom that he conducted of um, uh, Strauss tone poems. It was Don Juan uh, and uh, Death and Transfiguration and Beethoven's Seven. Mm. And he just totally blew me away that that is one of the greatest concerts i've ever seen just the sheer joy of music making on that stage it was so pleasant to watch Mm. a a concert which was as i always wished it would be when i went into music which was just serious quality high class music making so uh yeah that that was a really high point for me I, i walked out of the hall just buzzing after that what is the hardest work you've ever conducted? I mean, there is there is one really obvious one for me, um, which it's slightly boring in that uh, it's not standard repertoire, so a lot of people won't be able to relate to it. But I conducted a um, contemporary opera by Luca Francesconi called Quartet, with right. uh, two Ts at the end, that is. Um, that was at the Limbury Theatre in the Royal Opera House. And what was particularly challenging about it not just because of um, the you know high complexity of contemporary music but was the, the the specific point in time that I was conducting it it had been premiered at La Scala and there was a um, chamber orchestra in the pit but mm. there was also an off-stage chorus full-size chorus and right. off-stage full-sized orchestra <laughs> but of course of course, this, you know, for the longevity of the piece is an expensive, expensive proposition. Yeah. And so what uh, Luca had done brilliantly was to take the recording from La Scala and they'd managed to engineer it so that the chorus and offstage orchestra were on electronic tracks. Right. But there were also um, also electronic effects which were built into the music, which right. needed to be triggered by keyboard playing. So the only way of putting all of these different electronic effects together, including the offstage recordings, was to have a click track on the choir and on the offstage orchestra. But of course, the click track had rubato from the first performance. So the click track, which suddenly appeared in my ear every minute or so, uh, would move around like the wind. And I had to very much get that programmed into my body. So you had the joy of conducting the London Sinfonietta, hearing electronics all around you in this wonderful space that they'd set up in the Lindbury and then suddenly hearing your left ear with a, a variable click track and having to coordinate all of this with singers um, in fiendishly difficult music that was quite something that but good sounds... fun I crave a challenge <laughs> that sounds horrendous I've done pr- pretty much all of those things uh, but not all at once. Uh, I've done variable to click track. It was it wasn't a click track, but it was vet, um, when I conducted North by Northwest live to the film. That soundtrack was not conducted to click track, so the whole thing bent and swayed like you wouldn't believe, and with the streamers and pops and whatever on the screen. But yeah, to do all of that all at once is just oh, that's uh, that's hard. You know, I loved it. I loved it. It was really I good bet. fun uh, embracing something like that. And you've got time in the preparation of an opera as well to get it into your body. So yeah. that was cracking, cracking good fun. Um, I mean, I think uh, Ollie Nusson's music always strikes me as challenging if you want to uh, really honour the tempo relationships and do them justice. I think a lot of people skirt over them. Um, there's a, a stronger word I could use, but um, <laughs> to, to really keep his tempo uh, relationships which often involve listening for example to a distant clave whilst a, 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 a change is about to take place and to tune into that whilst there's some extremely off-putting music happening right up in front of you yeah. that's a real challenge um, I used to find it incredibly challenging but uh, I, I must say Um, I was lucky enough to work with Ollie quite a lot in uh, his last years, and he was so supportive, um, particularly in Stockholm at a festival of his um, that I had to step in for, um, to have him watching me from the gallery and then uh, help me through it and infuse about my conducting has, I think, taken a little bit of weight off my shoulder in Mm. conducting his music going forward. So um, perhaps less scary now, but... The final one, sorry, this is such a long answer, but the, right. the final one I'd give you, 
the final one I'd give you, which is in a nutshell, from an emotional level, um, I'd have to say Moonlight from Peter Grimes. Oh, yes. Uh, there's so much detail in the swaying back and forth of the waves. Uh, the, the small level swaying and the larger level crescendos and diminuendos. To get it precise, to get it accurate, but also to get rid of any technical worries and get the bigger picture of the mood is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I don't think I'll ever get it right. Um, Britain certainly did on mm. his disc. But there's a challenge. It's wonderful to have something like, like that living with you over the years. Going back to our earlier conversation about standing in, when I stood in for Andrus at 90 minutes notice, the four C interludes were the piece that we were due to start that concert with. And I'd rehearsed the four C interludes, but never performed them with any orchestra anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of performing them for the first time. And that moonlight movement, I agree with you. I'm, I was nodding away when you mentioned it. I thought, oh, yeah. Every time I turn up over the page from Sunday morning and go to Moonlight, I look at it and think, oh, it's this. It's one of the most sublime pieces of music on the planet, and it's such a bugger to conduct. It's so hard. Yeah, uh, and, so you know, hard. It, it, that concert, I just remember thinking, well, you know, Try, just try. Uh, but I'm sure the 50th performance of this will be a lot better than this one. <laughs> and the, Maybe you know, it won't be, I don't joy. know. <laughs> that's the joy is in the trying, isn't it? I, I mean, yeah. I played a lot in the Britain Peers Orchestra when I was young. And walking along that beach line there, yeah. uh, where it all happened in his mind, and feeling the the rise and fall of course you know you tend to exit the pub on those kinds of courses <laughs> in the early hours of the morning and you find yourself looking out at the moonlight in Oldborough over the water yeah. and the the water over the pebbles and so you feel like you know it so well and you know exactly what you're trying to achieve the character but to deliver that in that one shot that you have in performance mm. uh requires so much in terms of the atmosphere in the room but it's a glorious challenge to have when travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Easy. Uh, comfy trousers. It's the thing that goes in last into my suitcase so that it's first out the bag. Yeah. I think, uh, especially when you're zipping around to um, hotels, some of which are more comfortable than others, uh, it's the one thing which makes me feel like I'm totally relaxed when I get back to my room, is being able to, you know, put on a you know, tracksuit trousers and just flop onto the sofa or, or the bed or whatever it is. Um, it's, you know, there's nothing more soul destroying, I think, than uh, finishing a rehearsal, going back to my hotel room and then uh, sitting there in a pair of, you know, formal trousers or whatever, trying to relax uh, the rest of the day away. So, yeah, it's good for my mental health. <laughs> well, uh, dear viewers, I'm sure you, you, you can imagine this now. I, Andrew's sitting there in his uh, tracksuit bottoms, and I'm sitting here in my shorts because that's my version of his, you know, when I go abroad. If I have a pair of shorts, I can just sit there with my pair of shorts and relax. And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, 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 just, it just switches the brain into relax mode. Uh, and that's what. Yes, we need. I should have added. I should have added comfy shorts if I'm working with the Gran Canaria Orchestra, for example. <laughs> then it's much more shorts than trousers. Yeah. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? I mean, I, I'm sure you've had some standard answers to this. Uh, the, the, there's a real temptation, isn't there, Mike, to say um, travel and admin. I mean, the, <laughs> I'm always reluctant to complain about travel because, you know, when we're working, we're away from home, which if you uh, feel happy at home and enjoy your home life like I do, um, that is a bit of a dichotomy, uh, but it's one of the reasons I went into conducting. And I think, yeah. you know, it's a gigantic perk of the job to be going to all these wonderful places around the world as part of our careers. So I'd never say that. The admin thing, um, you know, of course, we'd all love to be just conducting concerts and, and rehearsals and, um, you know, having everything just presented to us as a fait accompli but again you know i wanted to get my hands dirty so that's why i went into conducting so it's a tricky one perhaps i'd say um perhaps i'd say relevance 
um, in terms of the wider world outside classical music, it's not so much that I feel I'd like to be understood more as a conductor, because frankly, there's a certain mystery about conducting, which I think it helps, you know, if you lose the, the, the novelty and if people really understand everything you're doing up there, then it takes a bit of the, um, the excitement away from the experience, but just the feeling that, um, that what we do as conductors really is, is, is felt to be relevant to the wider world around us and people in their, their lives. And Mm. I'm sure that was more the case at one stage, not for everyone, but um, I think, you know, there's this barrier has been set up and I'm very much looking forward to the future when we can somehow, um, I think, bring together some of these divides in a genuine way which isn't so tokenistic just so that people um yeah people are interested in what we're doing Mm. not so much understanding but they have a curiosity in what we do as conductors it was part of the reason for starting this podcast was i was sitting at home at the start of the pandemic thinking what are all of the other conductors doing they're doing nothing now because they can't do anything because there's no orchestras uh I could interview them. But when I interview them, I don't want any of the PR rubbish. I don't want all of the lofty aloofness. I don't want any ivory towers, uh, which is reason why the five of the 10 questions about you being a human being and five about music making. But I try and steer it away from, you know, I just want to know about you, the person. And I hope that more people do similar things and we don't have this. Yeah, you know, you know exactly. Well, we're talking about the same thing. This sort of, you know, uh, this the person who stands alone at the top of a mountain top that we should all gaze, gaze up at and think is a god. I hate that about the, our profession. Uh, um, hopefully, this has gone a little way towards breaking it. Um, I just Absolutely want people to right. know that we're human beings. You know, that's who we are. I'd also say, I mean, it's perhaps a dangerous comment to make, but uh, I feel it strongly that there's a a danger that um, uh, as audience members, we get lulled into it as well. There's, Mm -hmm. you know, people like, um, people somehow crave this ownership of the classical music world as audience members and like to be a part of it. And once they're a part of it, then they uh, inhabit the world, but um, to the detriment of others. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I know, I'm aware as every year goes by how little I know about classical music. And I think there are so many audience members out there who, who think they know everything about classical mm. music. And it really does put others off. I think, yes. you know, we're all in this journey to explore and learn as much as we can. So, uh, you know, should be open to everyone. Hear, hear. Absolutely agree. Um, which... Therefore, you know, if if the classical music world wasn't <laughs> the, 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 this is the, the cheesiest of all links I can think of, if the classical music world is not where you wanted it to be, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt instead? I think really it would be uh, it would be something to do with um, maybe not conservation, but uh, rewilding, perhaps something which really got me out there into. Uh, into the wilderness and um it sounds so cheesy but in touch with nature you know Mm. i i suppose it's partly growing up in so many exotic places and having having parents as well who really appreciate the the natural world around around us um i'd love if anyone ever had an idea for how i could have a conducting career and the same connection with music that i do but also square that with with work in uh, the conservation sector rather than just you know supporting charities and what have you it would be it would be really quite wonderful i think it's a byproduct also of the fact that as conductors we are drawn like moths to the flame to large cities where orchestras exist and the, the chances that we have to spend any time uh, you know in hilltops or on hilltops in woods in forests by waterfalls is is little or none you know it's down to your personal holidays or any day that you grab when you're away um and so yeah you crave it um oh to be a a Finnish conductor with their own island they can go and (laughs) boat off to in the in the the summer months um (laughs) And finally, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? 
well if i if i had time this is um <laughs> in that short in that short window yeah. i uh, i was so lucky uh last year when uh we were in the midst of the pandemic but uh we had a bit of a lull I managed to zip away with my partner to the Amalfi coast Ooh. and I had the most awesome experience on one day we rented a little speedboat the biggest one I could get without a license mm. and uh, drove up to a lunchtime restaurant it's called Il Cantuccio and uh, it's one of these ones on a beach you rock up in your boat and then this absolute whiz on a little dinghy comes and zips you over from your boat to the restaurant yeah and I mean, one of the reasons I'd say that is there's a real party atmosphere there, there in a way that only somewhere in Italy can can present. But they are famous for a dish called spaghetti alla Nerano, which is from the very localized beach uh, yeah. area there. And if you imagine um, spaghetti and your you know typical Italian cheeses. Uh, melted in there but with extremely soft well-cooked courgette so that the courgette becomes part of this sticky gloopy sauce mm. unbelievably good and they're actually uh, famous at that uh, restaurant for a drink which is white wine with peaches in it which is very nice but i think uh, if the world were about to end i'd probably need something stronger so perhaps an extremely stiff um Mexico style margarita would be up my street. <laughs> well, having been a lover of Italy, its coastlines and its food for oh, as long as I can remember, that sounds amazing. Um, absolutely love Italian restaurants, seafood, and even the white wine, which I don't drink at home as long as it's cold, I'll drink it. Uh, and it, uh, yeah, that sounds amazing. And Andrew, it's been an utter pleasure talking to you for the last hour or so, hour and a bit. And uh, maybe not an Italian restaurant, but hopefully we'll meet each other soon and we can sit down over a, a stiff drink and carry on chatting. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Oh, likewise, Mike. It's great to talk about these things with a fellow colleague. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. A Mike on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with a Spanish conductor who spent most of his musical life being the concertmaster in orchestras across the UK and Europe. But in 2019, he became the chief conductor of the Dallas Sinfonietten in Sweden, and one year later, he went from being the concertmaster of the Music Collegium Winterthur in Switzerland to being its chief conductor. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>